Good morning, church. It is good to see this church starting to fill back up again. Makes me a little more nervous up here, but it is good to see it (laughs) filling back up. Uh, Will you stand and join me in our call to worship? We exist because God made us. We are here because Jesus calls us. We are together because the Spirit binds us to each other. Without God, where would we be? Who would we be? Let us worship God, who makes us a community of love. Our opening hymn this morning is, I Know Whom I Have Believed. And if it's... Please be seated. This is a very blessed time in our worship service where we have the opportunity to lift our joys and our concerns before one another, our brothers and sisters in Christ who pray for us, who care for us, who hold us together in times that are difficult, and we need to give thanks for that. Um, But it's also a time of coming before our God and allowing our hearts to be opened. Um, and allowing God to hear those things that are on our heart, our joys and our concerns that are so necessary uh, for us to share with with our Father. All right, let's turn to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks always to be able to gather together in the sanctuary and come into your, your presence even more fully and to be able to gather with our family of faith that we love and that we know love us, to be able to share those things that are deep on our hearts, both the things that make us smile and joyful, but also the things that that crush us sometimes. Lord, we give you thanks for for birthdays and uh, other events going on in, in our lives that we are joyful for. We give you thanks for answered prayers. And Lord, we also lay before you those things that, that crush our heart, that make us hurt, that make us cry out. We ask that you be with family members and loved ones that 
are ill or have been injured in any way, that you surround them with your love and with your comfort and with your grace. We ask that you be with friends and loved ones who have lost family members. Mourning the loss of a loved one is a very difficult thing, and we ask that you be present with them, that you allow them to know that you are with them, that you never leave any of us alone in our troubles, that you go with us. Lord, we love you. We thank you for hearing the prayers that have been lifted. We also thank you for hearing the prayers that remain on our hearts. But through your Holy Spirit, you know them, Lord. And Lord, in this time, as we close, we lift up the prayer that your Son taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, so with that in mind, I want to take this time to ask a blessing upon the gifts and offerings that have been made. Um, so let us, let us lift those up to the Lord. Wow, I just lost my whole train of thought. So anyway, we want to thank God every single week for the monetary gifts that come in. They are so necessary to the lifeblood of the church and to the ministry that God calls us to. We also want to remember always and give thanks for the hands and feet of Christ in our church, the people that step it up and go above and beyond uh, to make things happen in the life of the church whether it's working on the tech team or the, the finance and audit team taking extra time and, and working diligently to, to make things happen. They are such, such necessary parts of the ministry that we are called to to help everything to go well. And we give thanks for that. So please remember all of those things in your prayers and let us lift them up to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the tithes and the offerings and the gifts that have come in to help support the church in all the ministries that it is called to. We give you thanks for the hands and feet of Christ in our congregation that through their effort and through their work and through their time give so much to this church and to its ministry. Lord, we ask that you bless each and every one of those gifts and offerings, that you multiply them, and that you use them to help us be the church that you are calling us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please rise and join us in the doxology? standing and join us in uh, our hymn of preparation, which is, I'll go where you want me to go. I wasn't familiar with this hymn until this week, um, but it is a fairly easy one. If you don't know it, but need something to help you along, it is hymn number 444 in your hymnal, so you can pull that out and follow along. Um, so anyway, it is good and it ties in with the theme, so enjoy the hymn.
Our scripture readings this morning uh, are first from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, story of Moses in the burning bush. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jericho, or, sorry, let me start over. Now Joseph, Joseph, let me start over one more time. <laughs> I told you I get flustered when you're all here. <laughs> now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest from Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called on him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering." So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people to the Bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 20. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. These, tw- 
These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you proclaim the message, the kingdom of, God, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or staff for the, work, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person to stay at their house until you leave. As you enter a home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to, your, to the local councils to be flogged in synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Heavenly Father, in all of our inadequacies, in all of our failures, you still continue to love us, and I thank you for that. God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence here among us. We thank you for the privilege to worship you in freedom. We pray that as your word is broken, as it is explained to us in it, that we would be filled with your spirit, that we would grow in understanding and wisdom, and that we might take that message out and share it with those around us. May we be like the disciples and go out and send your love and your blessings everywhere we go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I'm going to start this morning with the skit from the skit guys. Um, and we saw them before with the chisel. This one is called uh, the serenity prayer. And what I want you looking at for this isn't necessarily just the serenity prayer, which is a powerful prayer, but look at the interaction of God and the person praying. And we'll talk more on, on that in a little bit. So enjoy. God. I'm right here. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Hang on. Mm-hmm. You pray this prayer a lot. I love this prayer. It's a great prayer. It's one of my favorite prayers. Yeah. Top 10. Really good. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you really understand it. Oh, I, I do. I, I don't know that you do. Oh, I do. I really do. I understand the prayer. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's pride, and we'll deal with that later. Um, <laughs> but I, I want right now to just slow down. And let's really think about what you're praying. Slow down. Okay. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Do you even know what serenity is? Yes, I know what serenity is. Yes, it's the, it's the act of of serening. You know, it's it's, (laughs) it's serene. I T. It's serene. You know what? He was a knight in King Arthur's court. He was, he was serenity, and and. He was there, and he was kind of the tranquil, nice knight, you know? And then one time, Lancelot and King Arthur are about to do fisticuffs over Guinevere, you know? And, and he had enough, but he just said, serenity now, serenity now, you know? And everybody thought he was talking about himself, but he was really just stating the philosophy of life, which we now use in this prayer. So hashtag serenity now. So you don't know what it means? Nary a clue. Serenity. It is the absence of chaos. It is a hush, a pause. Mm. A hush, a pause. I like that. I want that for you. I want that for me too. Good. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change things. Hush. Like, mm-hmm. Pause. Yes. You've already negated the prayer. How, how have I negated the prayer? 
Because you're saying something you don't really mean. No, I do mean that. I mean that. No, you don't. Yes, I do. You don't. How? Think about it. You are always in the mix of things, constantly trying to... Direct. Manipulate. Direct. Manipulate. I think we should use the word direct. <laughs> you cannot manipulate me. Listen, I just want you to accept the simple fact that there are things in life that are beyond your control. Right. If I'm just to be honest with you, God, I think I, I like being in the mix of things. I like being in the middle of things, even if I shouldn't. I guess it gives me some significance in some sick, twisted way. And... Uh, if I were to turn it all over to you, I don't know what you're going to do with it, and I don't even know if you're going to include me in it. <laughs> but I know, I know, I just need to trust you, and there's, just believe and trust that there's nothing that you would not give me that uh, I could not handle. No, uh-uh. What? Yeah, I never said that. <laughs> no, but you said... No, no, no. no. I get misquoted so much. Um, <laughs> see, what I said was that there will not be a temptation to overcome you that you can't handle. As long as we're talking about this kind of stuff, can I just tell you something? When I close a door, I don't open a window, all right? That is just weird, all right? <laughs> if I don't want you to go outside, I'm not going to give you another way to go outside, all right? <laughs> Listen, this life, sometimes it's really going to be tough. And there are going to be things that come at you that you cannot bear. But nothing will ever come at you that I cannot bear. Thank you. I like this, this, this hush, this pause. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the... Hush, huh? pause. Yes? Let's talk about those things that you can do something about. See, my Holy Spirit has prompted you to do some things, and you haven't done them. <laughs> okay, in, in my defense, all right, if we're to look at all the things that I directly manipulate, all right, and then we see that the time that I have left, it's not a lot. I mean, there are just things that I got to do in life just to get things done, okay? This has just been a really busy season of life, that's, all right? That's an excuse. Okay, well, here's not an excuse, all right? Your word says to get wisdom from other people, and if I'm going to do my dreams and my visions that you want me to carry out and do, I need to get wise counsel before I take a step of faith and do them. Okay, but you're using that as an excuse. It's not my fault. That's an excuse. I'm terrified. That's it. I'm just... I'm just terrified. I know what I've done. I know the mess that I've made of my own life. And I know what it's like to fall on my face and then, and then to think that I'm gonna step out in faith for you to even attempt to do one of those dreams for you and, and to use the DNA that you've created inside me and take a step of faith. I don't wanna fail and I don't wanna fall. I have picked you up every time you've fallen. Every time. And I will continue to pick you up. I didn't give you a spirit of fear, but a power and love and self-control. I want you to live out of that. I know. I just need to let go and let... Me. Yes. <laughs> it's a really good phrase. It is. 
It's just so hard to do. I know. God, I'm so afraid. I don't want you to be afraid. Trust me. Hear me. That's how we're going to deal with your fear. That's where you'll get your wisdom. And wait on my timing. Don't get ahead of me and don't lag behind me. But you wait on me. That's when you're going to mount up with wings of eagles and you are not going to crawl through this life anymore, but you're going to start running. My child, you're going to run. You're going to run and you're not even going to get tired because you're not running by your own strength. You're running with my strength. That's the way to truly live life. And when you do that, you know what? I can do all things through you who gives me strength. Yes. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time. Aren't you going to do the whole, aren't you going to do the whole hush pause thing right here, God? No. No, you're starting to understand how precious life is. Sure, I'm trying, God. Ever since I said yes to you, ever since I realized what the cross is all about, I'm so thankful. I, I, I try to savor every day, every breath that I, that I live on this earth, and I'm so thankful for the yeses that you've given to, allowed me to have all the yeses. Thank you, God, for the yeses. And God, I'd be remiss not to thank you for the trials and the tribulations, the times that I've fallen on my face, oh, the times that, just, that you've turned just beauty out of chaos, God. I'd be remiss not to say thank you because the hardships have led me to a pathway of peace. But God, this world, Hush. oh, huh? Pause. Yes. <laughs> this world, like my son, I want you to accept this sinful world as it is, not as you would have it be, and trust that I will make things right. I surrender to your will. Right. Living one... Hush. Mm -hmm. Pause. Yes. <laughs> surrender. Yep. Surrender. Yeah. Surrender. I, I can't. I can. I can't. I can. I am not. I am. I am the great I am. Don't forget that. I don't know how. I don't know how. Let me teach you the unforced rhythms of my grace. Oh, my child, you're living this life with a clenched fist. Inside of you is this hurt child who keeps building up walls because you don't want to hurt again. And just as a child holds on tight to something that it's afraid to let go of, you are holding on to your hurts and your hang-ups and your habits. And you will never overcome them by white-knuckling them. This life that I gave you to live was not meant to be lived with a clenched fist but with an open palm. Surrender. Trust me. Okay. I surrender. I will trust you with all my heart. I will lean not on my own understanding. In all my ways, I will acknowledge you. And I'll just trust that you're going to direct my path. that I may be reasonably be happy in this, Hush. huh? 
pause. Yes. Now, let's say the prayer together. God, God grant, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting the hardships as a pathway to peace, taking as he did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he would make all things right if I surrendered to his will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever and ever in the next. Amen. So what do you think? Good skit? Most definitely. Hush, pause. What if that was a part of our prayer life? We'll talk about that a little bit more. Well, here we are in week four of Lent. Hard to believe that we are in week four, that we're getting so much closer to Easter as we go along. And we've been talking about the things necessary for our best prayer life. So week one, we had conversation about being mature in our faith. In other words, take it seriously and do it. If you have faith, give it a shot. You may not be perfect, but take your best stab. Go at it. Uh, you know, go at it as something that you want, something that you desire, something that you want to have as part of your life. Become mature in the faith by deciding this is what I want to do. Week two, we talked about being made in the image of God. Your life was designed with a purpose and a meaning. Live into it. Discover what that is and live into it. Week three, Last week, we talked about, is God listening? And we added the question, are we listening? Let God use you as the answer to someone's prayer. And you very well may be. Today, we're going to be talking about something a little bit different, but it's also necessary uh, to have the best prayer life ever. And that is the question of, are you ready to be changed? Are you ready to be changed? Are you ready to allow God to enter into your prayer life and say, hush, pause, and then have conversation with you about the things that you need to wrestle with, the rough edges that need to be smoothed out, the different things that we're even lying to ourselves about that we need to be awakened to, like the asking, do you even know what serenity means, or the surrender. How many of us go through life with our fists clenched because we're trying to control things? Yeah, me too. This is what God wants. This is what God wants. I love that from the skit. It's really cool. It also brought to mind for me a wonderful series that I I completely love by C.S. Lewis called The Chronicles of Narnia. Anybody read those before? or seen the movies, or whatever, the, you know, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and stuff like that. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. C.S. Lewis put this series together for kids as a way of sharing the gospel of Christ. It's an amazing story, and the Christ character in this story is a lion named Aslan. And when they describe the lion in the story, who is the Jesus figure, the one thing that they say is that Aslan is not a tame lion, not a tame lion at all. And if we think about our God, we could reasonably say that our God is not a tame God either, and we'll get into that. In the skit from the skit, guys, we see a God who is very loving, but also very honest. Honesty should always be good, but it is not always easy, is it? What would it be like for us if God interrupted our prayers and spoke truth to us in the midst of them? What if our prayers were a conversation back and forth with God as they should be? I guess we would first need to incorporate listening as part of our prayer life, wouldn't we? 
If God is listening, as we discussed last week, then we most certainly should be anticipating God responding to us in the midst of our prayer, shouldn't we? So God is not a tame God, but he is also always a good and a righteous God. If we allow him to speak to us through our times of prayer, we should anticipate that God's response may not be tame, may not be easy, may challenge us. So the question is, are you ready to be changed? Are you ready to be changed? If we take a look at our scriptures for, from today, when God speaks, we see change happen. And when God speaks to us, we should anticipate and expect change. Take a look at the story of Moses, right? Wonderful story. We all know this story. We all get the image and everything else. We see the burning bush up on the screen. We know that Moses is out there. He sees a bush burning, but it's not being consumed. So he goes to check it out. And before he gets all the way to the bush, he hears a voice saying, hey, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. And then God begins to have a conversation with Moses. What a powerful story. And we know the story because God is saying, I've heard the cries of my people in Egypt, and I am sending you to Pharaoh to get my people out of there, to set my people free, correct? Sounds pretty good. And maybe you could see a little bit of a challenge there. But in order to understand the challenge completely and what's going on and how God is in, in, <laughs> injecting into Moses' story in a way that is more powerful than we could imagine, we have to understand Moses' background, right? Where did Moses grow up? Egypt. Whose household did he grow up in? Pharaoh's. Why did he leave Egypt? He killed somebody, okay? He's a murderer in Egypt, and he's a well-known murderer because he was even known in Pharaoh's house. And here's God coming and saying, hey, I've heard the cries of my people in Egypt, and I need you to go to Pharaoh and set my people free. Imagine what had to have been going on in Moses' brain. It's kind of like, you know, if you were wanted for a crime and God says, okay, I want you to go to the police station where they have your picture all over the wall <laughs> and take care of this situation for me, right? Imagine what had to have been going on in Moses' brain at that time, but God knew what he was doing. God knew that no one better than Moses could go into that situation and have a conversation with Pharaoh and begin the negotiation process to get him out of there. But was it easy for Moses? No. If you continue reading on in that story, you see Moses going back and forth with God. I'm not a very good speaker. I'm, I'm kind of like, I, I stutter and I, I don't have a good tongue. Do you think my brother could go with me? It's a negotiation back and forth, but finally he goes. He goes because he accepts the promise that God will go with him, that God will equip him, and that he won't be alone in the journey. But he is changed in the process. And then if we take a look at our passage from Matthew today, this is Jesus sending his disciples. Up until this time, the disciples got to watch Jesus do everything. Who drove out demons? Jesus did. Who healed people? Jesus did. Who spoke with authority? Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He said, okay, gather together. I'm sending you out into the towns, and you're going to heal all illnesses. You are going to drive out demons. You're going to share peace with people, and you are going to do these things. But I tell you what, the words that he used were not ones that I would necessarily want to see on a recruitment poster for following Jesus. What did he say to them? He said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Now we hear that, but get that image in your head. You're a sheep, and there's a bunch of wolves around. And what do wolves like to eat? Sheep or anything else, but especially the sheep in that moment I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. 
that's like, hey, sign me up. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then he goes on and he says, therefore be as shrewd as vipers or snakes and as innocent as doves, be on guard. So I'm sending you, but it's going to be scary. <laughs> it's going to be scary. But they go. And they go because he promised. He said, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Hence the promise. I'm sending you, but I will be with you, and I will equip you, and I'll give you everything that you need to get through it. So yeah, we might worry about or be fearful of that hush, pause moment. We might be fearful of what God may say to us, but we have a whole litany of stories throughout Scripture that remind us that even when God calls us, He doesn't leave us alone. He goes with us. Take a look. Elijah gets scared, goes and hides in a cave, right? And has a whole conversation with God. Elijah, why are you in the cave? And they go back and forth, and there's fire, and there's earthquake, and there's all sorts of stuff, but it's a still small voice where God is present for him in the midst of that. We have Jeremiah having a conversation with God, God saying, hey, I want you to go and speak to my people. And what does Jeremiah say? I'm too young. And God says, time out. Who made you? <laughs> I made you. I know how old you are. You're not too young. Don't say you're too young. I'm going to give you the words to say. I will be with you. Now go and preach to my people, right? Then we have Zechariah, who was the father of John the Baptist. What happened to him in his conversation with God? Got a little choked up, lost his voice, right? Mary has an encounter with God too, and she ends up pregnant as a result of that conversation. So things are not always easy for people in their times when God is interjecting or coming into their prayer life or their time with God. Paul was blinded for a time, wasn't he? And we could go on and on and on. The interaction between people and God is an awesome encounter. It's an awesome experience, but it is not necessarily an easy one. But it is always a good one. I found this to be true in my own life as well. And I've been debating which story to share with you all this morning, but the one that I feel like is laid on my heart mostly to share is an experience that I had in the hollers of West Virginia. Anybody ever been to a holler? Anybody know what a holler is? A couple people? Okay. So hollers are down in, in the valleys and the hills of West Virginia and everything else. In fact, to get to the mission site, we had to literally go down these goat paths, and they were quite literally goat paths that were switchbacks all the way down into this valley to work at this family's house. This family didn't even have enough money to put shoes on their kids' feet, and we found the, the ground and everything else had nails and glass and everything in it, so we spent time trying to clean that up for them. And they had several kids, but they were living in a shack-sized trailer in that place. It wasn't enough room for them at all. So our job was going to be to build a platform that another team could come in and put a shelter on the platform that would add to their living space. Um, and it was very dry that week. We didn't have any rain or anything else. We were close to a creek, but there was no rain. And about the second day in, we're working, and we notice that it's getting muddy. And man, that mud stinks. And we discovered that when they put the septic line in, it was only a couple inches below the actual top of the ground, and by walking and taking lumber and everything else, we cracked it. So we were working in poop. And we got the mission team together once we discovered this and realized what was going on and said, hey, we want to have a check-in here and have conversation. This may not be safe for us to do because we're literally working in sewage. 
And we about had a mutiny on our hands because the mission team had fallen in love with this family. They saw the incredible need that this family had. And they said, even if you choose to go, we are staying and we are going to get this platform built so that this family can have a home to live in. They didn't care what the circumstances were. They didn't care what was going on around them. They didn't care about those things. They cared about what God had laid on their heart to do for this family. And we got that platform done in the course of that week. It was an amazing thing. It was God calling us to something more than we had anticipated or thought of or expected or whatever, but it was definitely the good and the right thing to do in that time. There's many other stories I could share. Friends, God is not tame. When we pray, we are not alone. And God very well may wish to speak to us and call us to something beyond our expectations. That's a good thing. That's a really good thing. Imagine if your prayer life became more of a conversation with God. Imagine those hushed pauses in the midst of your conversation with God. Imagine if you began to find yourself being used by God as an answer to the prayers of others. Imagine if you discovered that you were made for so much more than you could ever have dreamed of. Wouldn't that all be a blessing, even if it was coming from a not-so-tame God? If we read and believe Scripture, we should expect that God may change us, and that's okay. The good thing is that he only changes people into a better version of themselves, which is into the image he made for us in the very beginning, the one, the one that looks an awful lot like him. Amen? Amen. If you would, please rise if you are able. Join us in our hymn of sending, Here I Am, Lord. Are you ready to be changed? Are you ready to listen for God? Are you ready to surrender? Are you ready to respond if God calls? Here I am, Lord, send me. These are questions that we have to ask ourselves. These are things that we're being pushed to, pulled to. These are the questions that we're supposed to have as disciples of Christ. We should expect to be changed. In the process, we become closer to God. We become more like God. We become the image that he made us to be in the first place. Let's consider that. Pray on that question this week. Are you ready to allow God to change you? Beloved, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace. Amen.